Hey, good day, everybody. Welcome to the another interesting uh, interview with uh, Indian Boxer Ring. Uh, my guest uh, today uh, is someone who holds an artistic view on the breed, um, who actually uh, who holds true to the term uh, having a mental blueprint on the breed. Uh, we're going to talk about that in more detail. You're going to know more about Dania as we progress. Um, but on the chair today is Dania. Plastinac Bourier. Dania, apologize. My apologies ahead of time if I mispronounced your name. It's Plastinac, um, but I don't point it against you. <laughs> no, don't okay. worry. All right. Sounds good. And uh, Dania hails from France. Um, she originally is from Slovenia, but she moved to France in the year 2003 and has been uh, breeding and showing uh, boxes under the prefix uh, Contilia boxes. Uh, she does also have a website as well for those ones who want to check this out. Um, I mentioned in at, at the start that Dania has an artistic view, and the reason for that is it's a literal meaning. It's because she is an artist by profession uh, and is, you know, has uh, been involved in the past, uh, not actively, currently not active currently, but in the she has been involved with obedience and working trials as well. Now, Dania is an extremely busy, um, has a busy life. She's uh, three uh, extremely active kids that she uh, tends to. So her energies are devoted primarily to them. Uh, but she also does breed boxes um, and, is, uh, and is actually involved in um, breeding and showing them as well. Now, what are we going to talk about today? So that's a, that's a question that is in everybody's mind. Uh, in store for you in this interview are topics about the breed, uh, the evolution of the breed, uh, the deviation in the head, head type, and also about the ongoing issues with the breed. Um, I also want to claim, I want to actually put a quick disclaimer on this interview as well, because neither Dania nor I are veterinarians. So the views expressed in this interview are reflections of the problems facing the breed, and how deviation could possibly be attributed to the cause. Um, this is a, a breeder's perspective, breeder's view, but for a conclusive uh, evidence, uh, you know, uh, we are not veterinarians, so I just want to put that disclaimer out there before we get into this interview and the viewpoints. Now, for those viewers that are uh, tuning in and who would be watching this interview, um, feel free to put your questions up on the comments. And uh, this is an opportunity for me to put those questions in front of Dania as well. Uh, without any further ado, Dania, uh, how are you doing this uh, afternoon? I'm fine, thank you. Thank you again for inviting me. It will be a first time for me to be uh, online like that in live. So I hope that I don't mess everything up. <laughs> okay, all right. I, I know we have a lot to talk about, Dania. But before we get into that, um, <clears throat> I know a lot of... Uh, I know you're, you're a, you know, would, would, I, would I be wrong to say that Contelia Boxes is well known in the show, dog show ring in uh, Europe? Uh, probably I'm not the right uh, person to be asked that, but I guess that even though I have a very small uh, kennel, you know, I don't make more than two, uh, two liters per year overall. Uh, I think that my kennel is quite well known. Uh, not only in Europe, but uh, in other parts of the world also, yes. In, even if I don't do a lot of shows either, so, but I somehow, uh, I'm known, I don't know why, but it's like that. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, uh, your dogs, your reputation precedes your name. Uh, a lot of people actually did mention that Contilia boxes, hey, we're going to tune in for sure. Uh, now, before we actually get into the journey, your journey with Contilia boxes, I want to ask a bit about yourself. Um, how did you get your start with dogs? Uh, and how was your learning curve constructed? Because, you know, you are artistically inclined. You are an artist. Um, and you would have gone to school for that or you would have specialized in that. So how was your learning curve constructed when you actually got into boxes? Or dogs, rather. Yes, well, in fact, what is interesting in my... In my beginnings is that I come from a cat family. You know, my uh, we always kept cats at home. My mother was a breeder of Persian. You know, there are cats with very short nose and long hair. 
So uh, dogs were always uh, like a big no in our family. You know, I was all my childhood, I was asking to have a dog and it was no, 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 we have cats, we have all these cats. What are we going to do with the dog? And it's just not possible. So, but I, I love cats and uh, I still do, but I, I kind of felt that I need to have a dog. And um, so when I put a lot, enough money aside, I, uh, I think that the boxer was uh, an obvious choice because I was quite sporty also and I loved this uh, brachycephalic face because I was used to it already from cats. So I uh, kind of uh, organized to buy a really beautiful puppy uh, behind my father's back. <laughs> and uh, I was only 18 at that time and I bought this beautiful puppy at home. I was lucky to know a person who connected him with a very well-known Italian breeder. You know, in the 90s, Della Cadormare Kennel was a very, very big name. Uh, so uh, I got hold of really wonderful puppy. The, I did not really know what he was at that time because I realized that only after I began to be involved in the club and all that. And uh, uh, knowing to read his pedigree, I understood that this was really a big puppy that I had on my hands. So uh, this is how it all started. And, uh, but I did not have any um, special show ambition because we did that with cats. You know, my, we did a lot of shows all over Europe and I found the, found the world a bit, uh, not always very, uh, how to say, uh, clean. You know, it was uh, very competitive and a lot of backstabbing. So I said, I don't want to do that with my dog. I just want to have a beautiful puppy with, um, nice temperament, you know, companion that will be, uh, uh, that I will be able to do everything uh, with, uh, you know, in my spare time and otherwise also. So, uh, but when I, uh, when I got a bit into the breed and uh, saw him uh, evolve and uh, I was kind of pushed to go to a first show, he was already, um, Almost, uh, he was a young adult already when I did first show with him, and it was a, a yearly championship in Slovenia with uh, Brigitte Müller from G Germany judging. You know, she's a very well known and respected judge, and uh, and he won the best of breed that day. You know, so it was my first dog, my first show, a uh, specialty show with a specialty judge, and uh, he won everything. You know, I was just like totally overwhelmed. And, and I guess this was kind of point of no return. <laughs> you know, uh, I understood that, uh, that this is really a nice dog and that maybe I should do an effort to, to move forward with him. And so it went on and it was a beginning. He was born in 96 and since I'm actively involved in this breed. Wonderful. Uh, now, was it a logical transition? Now that you mentioned that you, uh, your family was uh, involved, or your mother used to breed cats, and you used to be at shows all over Europe. Um, was it actually uh, the, you know, the, you know, was it a no-brainer that you actually, when you bought a dog, you were going to show, or was that something which, uh, which was influenced because you know some, you know, you you were influenced by your friends or you had a mentor? How did that come about? In fact, uh, it, wa it was a no-brainer for me to get a pedigree dog of good origins. This was never a question uh, because I already at that time I had a kind of visual uh, ability to, to see a beautiful dog from an ugly one, even if I did not work, did not know world of standard at that point. But I could say this is a beautiful dog and this is an ugly boxer, you know, so I was able to say that and that's why I was able to pick this puppy up from the litter without uh, knowing, you know, what a box of baby should look like. And I, I picked him up at uh, four weeks old and he began to be a multi-champion later. So uh, I had this uh, feeling for, for harmony, I don't know, for beauty uh, since when I was very young. And, uh, and I guess with showing cats, with selecting cats and making uh, choices for breeding, helping with my mother uh, with that. Uh, I guess it has kind of put me on a certain path of not just considering the dog as a, as a companion, but uh, understanding of the importance of the work behind the, behind the dog. So yes, for sure, it, it, uh, 
it, it played a role the fact that I uh, that we were breeding cats at home at that time. But I have to show it was a different thing because uh, show, showing cats is very different from dogs. You know, you have uh, you have cages. And, uh, and it's very calm, you know, the environment is extremely calm and organized and, uh, and shows, dog shows in Europe, this is like a total uh, chaos, you know, there are multi-breeds, I mean, uh, this is like a lot of noise and all these dogs running left and right and hair dryers. And so when I first visited the dog show, I was like, oh my God, what is that, you know? So I was not particularly interested in this world. It came, in fact, um, by itself uh, through my dog you know because i saw that uh, that he's really a beautiful puppy and we had these uh, monthly uh, club meetings uh, that i really appreciate today because i saw that it was really a nice way to gather our club members uh, around a small drink you know and uh, we had an evening of uh, discussing our dogs and what we did with them and it is really a, an excellent way to to keep the the club members active in fact in a nice way not only through shows but also through the other aspects of uh, you know dog ownership um this was all in slovenia at that time huh? so uh and after slowly gradually I, uh, I started to visit more and more shows and i saw that it was beginning to be uh, really serious i was starting to get uh, you know making uh, requests and this is when it came, became obvious that i have to uh, to pass also working exam with him and uh, as he was really my uh, hard dog uh, it was totally unimaginable for me to send him to a professional to pass his working trial <coughs> Sorry, so I did it uh, alone. So I was a young girl uh, without much experience in uh, in dog behavior or in uh, you know how to to canalize your dog. I did not know any of, any of that. So I basically learned uh, everything uh, with his help. And look, I was very lucky to have a really top dog on my hands. He had a wonderful temperament, and it made it easier because it was not easy to uh, to learn all. All this through one single dog. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Daniel. Um, I want to actually ask you this. Um, I want to actually, this is something I ask uh, any any breeder who comes on the show. Um, you know, uh, the question is, how was your mental blueprint? You know, what was your ideal boxer when you started with your first dog? What is your blueprint or your mental picture of your ideal boxer now? Is it the same? Has it changed? How and why has it changed? I think uh, you you don't really have uh, this kind of uh, priorities, you know, when you're starting in dogs because you just don't have the knowledge to make conclusions. You know, you just love your dog and you think that your dog is perfect. Basically, this is that. I think that everybody went through this through this point where they were so in love with their own dog that they thought, and when you have certain results at shows, you think that your dog is the, the perfect thing and everything that is a bit different is, there is a problem, you know. Uh, the, the blueprint, in fact, is formed after when you study the breed, but study means really to be really critical first towards your own dogs and then applying the standard that you have to know really word by word and really by heart and then you you stamp this to to individuals and compare it you can only do that when you have a certain level of knowledge i think that not everybody necessarily has this level of knowledge to to judge i hope that judges do i believe they do but we are talking about breeders also those who create dogs to be shown after and uh, and i think that this um, this blueprint is formed after uh, experience in the breed, but after how this is formed, it depends on the influences you know that you get, the the people that you meet, the the, the capacity to learn. Also, I believe this is different for everybody, and and self criticism also because you have to uh, admit that you are wrong before, that you have to overcome your fixed ideas, for example, you know, this we call it kennel blindness, but it can be also just uh, dog owner blindness, you know, it's the same, it's just as when you have, a, when you're a breeder, you have a larger responsibility because you produce new examples of the breed and uh, so you should know more. I hope this answered partially. Yes, uh, yes it, does, it does, it does, it does. 
Uh, but again, uh, I'm not, I, I do have a follow-up question to that. Um, now, this is again based on, on what your profession is. Your profession I mentioned, I think a few times, I think I mentioned about three times already, that you are an artist by profession. You're commissioned by people to, to, um, to actually to render art um, on the, on you know on um, which also you know which could be uh, you know again I'm not going to go deep into this because I might be totally wrong but you look at things in terms of planes and angles you know in terms of you know from an artistic viewpoint how can you best use uh, you know a canvas to draw a picture so I also mm -hmm. know that an artist is the biggest critic of their own art. If you're an artist, you are the biggest critic of your own art. Like, for example, I'm, I'm, I'm going to actually make a guess here. Um, you know, even the famous picture that is, you know, stung up on the wall, uh, the artist might say, oh, there's something wrong with that picture. You know, that could actually be different. I could have done this better. Now, being an artist uh, who is able to visualize things, that puts you in a unique place, uh, which is not which is not which is not the same for let's say for me i can actually say okay so this is how it's going to look but if you ask me to draw my drawing is going to be bad but you being an artist who is able to visualize this thing do you feel it is actually being an artist uh is a boon meaning it's a gift or is it a bane a curse as a boxer breeder uh I don't... criticizing your dogs and you mentioned about kennel blindness your uh, pursuit for perfection are you going to be is that good is that good for you or is it bad for you uh i think that uh, uh it's it, it sometimes uh, hurts to to see uh, all your faults on your dogs more than most of the people do but i think that this is the only way uh, to progress because um if you cannot uh, judge your own dogs, uh, you will not be able to do it on other dogs either. So it's kind of dead end. So me uh, being uh, having this talent that is in my genes, uh, I did not do much about it after I developed it in, in schools that I that I did. But for sure, you are taught to observe and then analyze and and then put it on paper. So and this is basically the same uh, process that any breeder uh, should be able to do when they decide where they want to bring their breeding. You have to see the dogs, you have to analyze them and then you have to decide how to make the changes to to create something new. So it's not only the reproduction of what you see you need to be able to make choices what kind of combinations you will do to get a certain results at the end so yes your question if uh, if this is a a plus or a minus to be uh, to have this gift to observe uh, i think it's a plus and I, not only that but i think it's it's a must for for this activity because uh even if i'm not a judge i think that you are in a in a very creative position as a breeder and so you absolutely need to have an eye for for dogs to be able to uh, to be creative as a kind of artist as a breeder because this breed is very characteristic i think uh many will agree that this is one of the hardest breeds to breed because it it is very uh, pushed to you know very thin line between uh, uh too much and not enough and um, and we cannot deny that many artists were involved in creation of this breed in the past because i think this is basically an artistic breed because it, it's so when everything falls uh, on its place this is a magnificent dog at the end they are really special it's a mix mixture of everything you know it's a correct type for this breed is something very very unique i had this luck uh, that i was involved also a bit through my acquaintances in the past uh, to to get to know other breeds also uh and i finally i came back to, you know to conclusion that boxer is really something uh, something different than most of the breeds got it uh we, we're going to talk about the munich silhouette in just a minute because just like you said uh the munich silhouette was put together uh, by the breed forefathers uh, you know, on what the ideal boxer should look like, even though at the time that the Munich silhouette was put together, boxers did not look like that. Uh, boxers looked different 
but they actually envisioned a boxer to look different. And so at this interpretation, how the breed was going to evolve later. So we're going to get to that in just a minute. Before we do that, I actually uh, wanted to ask you this question about, uh, you know, about your, uh, you know, something I know on your website. You know, you actually mentioned that you met uh, Eric, uh, your, uh, I, I, is it, I don't know if it's fair to say he's your better half or you are the better half, but he, <laughs> he actually, you met him in, so you met him in uh, 2003 uh, at, at, at a box. Um, and you said that you had some common thoughts uh, about boxes. That's what brought you together. So what were some of the common thoughts uh, that brought you together? When I met Eric um, uh, at Ati Box in Poland, and uh, we were, it was very funny uh, circumstances. In fact, it started to rain, like, but really like, you know, monsoon, it was really pouring rain. And we got stuffed under the same tent, hiding from rain. And he was with his French uh, group of friends who are, you know, the breeder of Paris, Cordoba d'Europe and uh, Noël de Zormont, the Sulu. There were all these bunch of friends together speaking French and, and uh, I was there alone with my dog in the cage. And so we kind of started to discuss. I mean, at that point, we were not really, how uh, to say, big connoisseur. You know, we were just uh, two passionate uh, owners of dogs. Him, he was, uh, his chapa was uh, in young. He won that year, the title, that said. Uh, me, I was in the, my dog was already six at that time. And I was just showing him in champion group. And uh, it was, uh, yes, it was a meeting of two, two passionate passionate people in the breed. But we, even though we came from different parts of Europe uh, with uh, different ideas in the head, finally, about, um, about boxers, not totally formed yet because we were still in the process of, um, of learning, you know, of uh, making the base finally for in the head, I would say. Uh, what we absolutely agreed upon was that the boxer is a, is a family dog that uh, that lives with its owner, you know, it's, uh, which I still believe today. I think this is one of the breeds that absolutely needs um, the, the contact with the, with the human, you know, they always search for that. And Eric was coming from a family of, of boxers. They've had a, a boxer since decades before, but only as a as pet dogs, you know, they were not really involved into selection and, uh, but yes, uh, he, uh, and this was one of the things that brought us together was this love for, for the dog as a person, you know, not only as an object of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, analysis and all that, but mainly as a friend. Because I, it's not always the case, you know, in Europe, uh, you have kennels where dogs are kept in cages and uh, so, for me, it was uh, right. important to have uh, somebody who understands this uh, aspect of, of keeping dogs that looked like mine. Wonderful. Excellent. Thank you so much. I hope uh, Eric, when he gets to watch this, uh, is going to like your response. Uh, but uh, <laughs> OK, um, I want to actually move on to the evolution of boxes um, now. Um, I, I, I was wanting to ask you this question later, but I will ask you this ahead of time because our questions in that that's going to follow are going to be based on what I'm going to ask you right now. Um, so in terms of evolution of boxes, how boxes have evolved, and this is purely your viewpoint on how it's happened. So from the starting point, what are the, what are some of the things that have happened uh, to improve the boxer breed. And uh, on the flip side, what has been the biggest detriment to the breed? Uh, I think that European boxer went through uh, severe changes in in past two decades uh, due to two, two main factors. I thought about this question. And... Uh, and one of the determinant points was that we were obliged to, obliged. it was not an obligation at the beginning, but at this point it is, we have to do a lot of health tests before, before breeding. This was a, an important point, I think, positive in my point of view, because I think that it, long term it allows to produce dogs that have a better quality of life. You know, so in, in Europe, we have to do, uh, we have to test hips. 
we have to test heart and, and back. And if you want more, you will do also the kidneys, you will do the shoulders, the knees in Scandinavia, knees are obligatory, for example, in Sweden. Uh, so this, this led to uh, eliminating of certain gene pool, you know, because uh, dogs that were not perfect were just not used anymore. This can be a positive point or but long term, I'm afraid it is a negative point also. You know, in the, back then in the 80s, they were absolutely not, uh, not under this kind of pressure. They, they were just looking up, they, they did hips, but even the sea hips were okay for breeding. All the rest was kind of, you know, we will see what happens. So they were basically selecting on beauty and on temperament, on, on the looks, on the workability, uh, but not so much on uh, preventive health results as we do now. And the second thing that happened to European boxer, which is not the case in other countries in the world, is a cropping and docking ban. And I think that this was a huge downfall for, for the breed in Europe. Uh, it should not be, but it was. I'm sure that it played um, an important role of the style of how the boxer developed in the last two decades. You know, the fact that ears are down, mm -hmm. It's, it's an important I, element. I, uh, I actually have a question on that, uh, based on what you just said. Um, could you actually expand on, again, I'm not an SPCA advocate by any stretch of imagination, uh, and I'm not. this is not a question about docking or cropping per se, but I want to ask you um, specifically in terms of cropping. How has that changed the complexion of the breed? Has that, is that, you know, is that because uh, uh, people actually wanted that perfect ear set or the ear, uh, the thick ear leather, and that has actually thickened the skin of the boxer? Could you actually talk more about how cropping has impacted the breed or lack of crop? Uh, yes. Crop. If, we, uh, if we check a bit the countries where uh, they had to undergo the, the cropping ban, for example, England, we will see that uh, they have problems with skin also. Because before, when we were cropping ears, we were actually looking for a very strong uh, ear shell, you know, which would finally allow to have uh, standing ears as quickly as possible and have really solid ears. So it, the ears could not be too heavy. And all that, in fact, the, these things are uh, interconnected. In fact, if we search for a uh, uh, dry head, we will also have a thinner ear, you know? So I'm not saying that just because we had to uh, have natural ears that had the correct uh, band in front and not, you know, have a rosy ear turning backwards, which is a mistake. But all these little details, uh, generations and generations finally led to, to dogs that are too skinny, that have uh, too large ears, in fact, because boxer should have a middle-sized ear, not a long ear. So all this played in a small part uh, uh, in, in, in losing the correct uh, uh, type of the, the boxer yeah. of today's world. And the fact that they have tails also, it, it played a role in, in overall construction. The rears, the rear ends changed, the top lines changed. It's, it's. I'm sure that I mean, uh, ear and and tail ban uh, changed the breed. I don't think that we we maybe uh, participated too much to allowing this to happen. But this is one of the things that should be really taken into consideration if we want to recover the, the correct type back. What to do, how to keep uh, correct ears without uh, having too many wrinkles on the head. Uh, you know, it, this kind of details really uh, play a, a huge role long term, I think. Right, right, true. Um... I want to actually. I want to get. I want to get more into the. Uh, you know, into the specifics of the head, uh, because you know, um, the head is actually like the center stage for a boxer. Um, and again, my question is not of the. You know, whether the boxer is a head breed or not. But you know, I want to actually ask you about the which we um, which we started off with um, the Munich silhouette from. 100 odd years back. Uh, I would say, I think if I date back this, it would probably be 1896 or 1906. Uh, the Munich silhouette then, and the boxes that have 
the the shape or the silhouette of the boxer right now uh european boxer which you are exposed to in a to a large extent it's very different the munich silhouette is and the european boxer if you put them face to face the silhouette next to one to each other yeah. they are looking very different they are two different breeds altogether they are brachiocephalic but they are very different breeds altogether yes. uh do you as a breeder my question is twofold how do you look at it as how do you look at it as a, as a breeder how does it actually uh, what are your views about that and my second portion of the question is do you attribute the deviation to the head proportions due to the unequal importance uh, or inequal importance rather place to the aesthetics on the looks um i think that uh to say about aesthetics in fact uh, it's a very uh, subjective question you know because in europe they like uh, breeders like very big muzzles and they find short muzzle beautiful you know and you show these heads in the states and they will say wow this is not a boxer you know here's a munich silhouette but in fact the problem is that uh, we don't have the same uh, how to say uh criterias i mean i'm saying we because i'm in europe uh i changed over time <laughs> because i saw that it was just no go where what we are doing in europe it just cannot go on like that because otherwise uh people have to really open up and and learn a bit more what is happening outside to have a, a larger view you know of the of the breed because for most european breeders what is outside of europe is just not a boxer and it doesn't exist they don't they are not interested really unfortunately this is big majority of of, uh, of breeders that i discuss with uh, luckily things are changing recently uh, because uh, they are all astonished when they see a beautiful elegant dog but then they ask themselves oh how did we get that far you know far away um, so it's a there are two things that play a role again, and this is that there is a different uh, cultural context of uh, of uh, you know of comparison. In fact, uh, to Munich silhouette, for example, in the States, this is still a, a blue blueprint for the head profile, still more than 100 years uh, later. But in Europe, they were like, uh, "What is Munich silhouette?" <laughs> you know, it's a. Uh, I'm sorry to say, but uh, I would say that uh, one to two head ratio is not really important in Europe anymore. And this is where uh, wedges and clubs, breed clubs should get back to the, to the, to the matter to really see uh, if what we do today is still a boxer or not that much, you know? And, uh, and to, to go back to the one of the last questions is this responsibility of the club club uh, breed clubs is that i think they should educate new breeders and even those breeders that are not uh, in the breed since yesterday uh, about the correct uh, head ratios that are really finally the essence of this breed you understand that with time that you understand that if we don't have the the correct muzzle length uh, the rest will go kind of you know also to hell because once you shorten the muzzle to get the more volume on, on the front face you will get different characteristics in the body also you will get right. more bone eventually too much bone you will get coarse body you will get dogs that mature too soon etc 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 it's a it's a big list of of things that are consequence of shortening of the muzzle right Right. Uh, okay. and this, I'm sure that, uh, I must add that this is coming from somebody who started with short muzzles. I had my first uh, bitch was uh, Ati Box champion and she was very short. You know, her father was also Ati Box champion. His mother was very short also. So I had to go really uh, far. You know, I had a very rough past to to make to understand in fact that the dogs that were finally um, top winners that were really excellent dogs they had good temperament and everything but they were not really correct i mean you know so uh, with learning with being critical you finally uh, open your eyes and see that this is okay we went 
towards that, but we should go in the other direction now because you know if you go further to the same path, you will finish with the uh, with the uh, oversized bulldogs, basically. Right. Right. True. Uh, I actually wanted to ask you about you know I want to actually you know with this premise I want to I want to look at what are the issues that are facing the breed uh, you know because of the deviation in uh, the deviation in the head style uh, I want to actually give it a premise ask you a question um, now I think I uh, I think you might have seen that interview two weeks back um, I interviewed a guest Linda Nuslin. And uh, Linda, in that interview, she actually mentioned, just imagine you're cramping all the furniture in a house. Um, instead of in three rooms, you're cramping them all in one room. That is what has happened because of the head, the shape yes. of the head changing. And that actually point, um, you know, actually that 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 actually hit the hit the hit the, hit the point uh, right on the right on the head. But I want to actually talk, ask you uh, with that premise. I also want to ask you about this. Uh, I have read that increased uh, with you know increased stages of uh, you know brach brachycephaly, uh, you know, is also a perfect uh, you know is also a perfect reason. It's also an attributable reason for stenotic nares uh, because the nares the nasal entry gets narrower, and because of that, stenotic nares is obviously is is the issue uh my question is this uh we all know that this is an issue but when did this become acceptable or when did it become acceptable in the evolution of the box ahead to have stenotic nares in europe um uh, this was probably would be a better question for someone who has been uh in the involved in the breed since probably 70s you know when the muscle was still of correct length uh, because I came after, you know, I came after when short nozzle, muzzles were already accepted. So what would be interesting would be to understand the transition. Why? And there are certain dogs that clearly were so important and uh, they were very predominant uh, stud dogs, for example, that were short. And uh, as a consequence, they were used a lot, like hundreds and hundreds of matings. And, uh, and, uh, it kind of became acceptable uh, with time. Uh, I don't know if before, probably they did, the judges, as they were different school, they were checking the, the nares, you know, up front to see, if, to check for the symmetry and that they were large like the standard asks for. But some kind, somehow it, uh, it just became of secondary importance and I did not have a single judge that really checked uh, that on my dogs, honestly. And uh, and I think this is an extremely important point because pinched nostrils are a, a huge functional disability for a dog and it, they affect the quality of life. So when we are at that, this is an alarm, you know, because I think that breeding of dogs should be mainly to uh, to produce healthy animals that can have a good quality of life. And when this is jeopardized, uh, there is a problem. Mm -hmm. There's clearly a problem and it should be put under a question mark. So yes, like Ninda said, I think this is extremely important for breeders or anybody involved in this breed is to understand that, uh, that brachycephalism is a, is a syndrome. It's a mutation that occurred and then uh, as somebody wanted to create an interesting different breed they use this mutation uh, and multiplied it in order to fix it as a breed trait so it's a it's a syndrome and uh, and with other brachycephalic breeds uh, like uh, pug or bulldogs we can see that it was uh, brought too far and as a result, we have dogs that are basically not able to live normally. It's kind of normal for their owners, but uh, sorry when I see a dog, uh, um, English bulldog uh, who is at the vet, and he's a bit excited and he's he's choking half of the time, you know, because his uh, prolonged palate is that long that uh, half of inhalations are stopped by his palate. So this is not normal. Yeah, the owners use them, it's kind of okay. It's it's the it's the breeder. Well, I'm afraid that uh, something similar is happening to a boxer. Just maybe not to that extreme yet, but yet 
I'm not saying that it will not happen if we don't uh, pay attention to it. So mm -hmm. the Munich silhouette was uh, created to, uh, to have a brachycephalic breed, but not extreme, because I think this is one of the characteristics, uh, uh, essential characteristics of this breed is that this is a brachycephalic breed of uh, medium size, sporty, uh, athletic dog uh, without exaggeration. Boxer is that. So when you see any kind of exaggeration, hmm. it's not a boxer anymore for me. Right, right. Um, I, so, I yes, to... Just to, to, to add a bit more to the, to the head yeah. profile, in fact, like mm -hmm. Linda said, uh, we have to understand that this uh, material that is in the foreface, you know, all the inner skin and all that, when you, when you push back towards the skull, all this material is the same as on the breeze that have a really long muzzle. Then this is getting to be pushed in. And in fact, the skull will be larger. You know, the eyes will get apart to make room for all this behind. The problem is that the boxer standard also asks for a lean skull. So we have a kind of paradox. You know, we cannot do both with keeping a good, healthy dog. If you want to have a nice skull, we must have a four face to have room for everything to function normally inside. Right, right. No, and again, I, I think I think that's a fair point because you know you, you know, the wrinkles on the outside is actually also has an aberration on the inside as well. You know, uh, which, yes, which should be constricting to the to the nasal passage of the yes. dog and absolutely. I I totally understand that. That's we have to understand that the skin is not only what we see from outside, we have a skin that goes inside the nose and until the throat. This is all skin. So mm. it's not for nothing that the standards ask for uh, fitting skin, you know, thin skin with uh, which is fitting tight to the body. There is a reason for that. The standard is really perfectly made, really. Mm -hmm. So if we respect the standard, we will keep a functional dog of beautiful looks, elegant and sporty at the same time. Yeah, they were really genius, uh, the, the creator of the standard, because if you really study it, you will see that this is a, it's a really very precise guideline uh, mm -hmm. with the correct type. Okay. I actually wanted to, uh, I want to actually take a, I wanted to take a, a small detour. I want to come back to the head again. But I want to actually incorporate this element, um, uh, which uh, for uh, for somebody like me in Canada, or you know, for people that are tuning in from, let's say, from uh, from the United States, a major portion of them, uh, or even India, for that example, we're not so used to seeing boxes uh, do working trials, right? So working trials, yes, I'm I'm not going to say totally, but to a major portion, we don't do it. And that's, for us, is a differentiator between a European boxer, which has to do uh, working trials in order to become a champion. Uh, yes. But my question is this, are we actually stretching the term working trials with a boxer? That's number one. Number two of a question is, do you think it is fair uh, since you have been uh, engaged in working trials, not right now, but in the past, do you think it's fair to expect a boxer to work like other breeds, like, for example, a Malinois or a, Bel or a Bloodhound or a German Shepherd, for that example? Do you think it's fair to expect a boxer to behave like that? Uh, well, um, to answer the first point of the, um, of the question, were... Boxer is not really a working dog anymore, honestly. It was a working dog during the war because they had to use all the dogs that were capable of functioning somehow, you know, to be useful. But uh, after it became a, me, I called, you know, Schusskund and all that. This is, for me, this is a it's sport. It's not a working dog. And there is some kind of a really uh, misunderstanding to think that, um, a dog that is making a sport competition uh, is a walking dog. Not necessarily for me. This is not the same thing for me. A walking dog is a dog that you know is uh, is guarding, for example, and he's able to function independently from his uh, from from the person that is guiding him. For me, this is a walking dog. You know, uh, what we use boxer for in Europe today. This is a sport, a competition sport. 
Well, we have Ring or we have IGP, but now, now it's called like that. Uh, before it was shoes uh, round. It, it's a it's a discipline, a sport discipline with very precise, uh, you know, schema of of program that the dog has to execute in perfection. The you know the most detail it is, better it is. And this is how the points are counted. Then you have, for example, in 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 France, you have a ring. This is the discipline that that demands a bit more independence of the dog, you know, the, because the the dog is not always under influence of the the person who is guiding him. He has to make decisions by himself. He has to uh, react to stimulus from outside. The programs change from one parcours to another, so it's a different kind. But these are sport dogs; they are not really working dogs. So uh, to 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 go forward. Uh, today, uh, in sport competition, unfortunately, the, the shoes hound program I think fits better to uh, to a Malinois uh, than it does to a boxer, because a boxer, what makes him different from other working dogs, is like we call them here, is that it has a mind of its own. You know, it's a, it's a thinker. And uh, it's a delicate dog also because they have a very good sense of fairness. You know, it takes time to train them. You have to have a lots of patience. You have to really understand your dog. And when you work with Malinois, I'm not an expert for the breed, that's it. But from what I could observe, it's a dog that is much more, you know, switch on, switch off. They have extremely pronounced prey drive and they work on that, you know. It's a dog that you can switch off, switch on. This is, boxer is not like that. So I think that bo boxer is a wonderful, versatile dog that can be a perfect family dog. It can be a perfect nanny for the kids. You can take him to any kind of environment. You know, you can take him to an urban environment. You can take him to hiking, to mountains. Um, it's a versatile breed. You can also do sports with him. You can do agility with him, but it's a breed that has uh, limits also at the same time. It's a square dog, uh, quite tall and rather heavy comparing to other breeds. So it's not a optimal competition dog, honestly, but there were some exceptions and they, they did it. So head down for, for those uh, trainers that achieve to bring their boxers that far. They can do it, but generally speaking, uh, what is specific for the boxer is their uh, multiple use for different uh, different things. But to really exceed in something, no, I don't think so. All right. Uh, I want to actually ask you this, um, this question here. I want to actually, the, my, my question is about uh, thermal regulation, uh, thermal regulation or thermal regulation. Uh, now, I know that boxes uh, being brachycephalic uh, also suffer severely from heat susceptibility, right? Uh, because they cannot take the heat so well and they breathe through their mouth. And sometimes, you know, they actually have syncope as well because of that, you know, uh, you know, they actually have fainting as well. These are some of the issues facing the breed, right? Uh, now, in the context of this, in the context of the issues that uh, the boxes are susceptible to, how important do you feel are the muzzle proportions the muzzle you know you said uh, you know you know it's it's actually one is to two right now you know it should actually it's it's changed or even it's sometimes it's half is to two uh, i would say two and a half being two in the skull and half in the muzzle you know sometimes it's well, like that it can be much worse than that it can be right right i'm just being generous then um so if muscle proportions are like that uh and they can potentially inhibit the respiratory functions uh, because of the muzzle, you know, how snub the muzzle is, um, is that that's not a, that's that not impact the ability of the dog when it's doing difficult physical task or working trials? This is absolutely a functional uh, disability, like I said before. Uh, some would disagree with me, they would say, oh, but you know, my, my boxer who had a short muzzle was really good biter, he could catch the sleeve, okay. Okay, but honestly, it's a disability because the, the boxer cannot uh, cool down. He doesn't have the same volume in the in the nose as the long muzzle breed. It's a it's a functional problem. 
whatever somebody wants to say. Okay, they will bite because they have a big heart and they, you know, they will forget, but they will hold even if they are choking at the same time. But uh, honestly, shorter muzzle doesn't have one single justification or uh, plus. There is not one single reason why we would justify a shorter muzzle than the one that is stated in the standard. There's not one positive point, except maybe that you say, okay, but I like bigger muzzles. So, you know, when you have a shorter muzzle, uh, they would be larger for, for watching from face. But honestly, is that really so important? I don't think so. I think we should first think about the well-being of the dog. We should not, I don't want to look like be fishing, but we are facing global warming and it's going to get hotter and hotter and it's going to get hotter and hotter for our boxers also. So it's important to maintain the good quality of heart. I think that this is very, very important, at least as important as the muzzle length and to keep the, the muzzle uh, proportions as the ones that are stated in the standard. Because like that, our dogs will not be in the groups, uh, you know, in the group of uh, uh, brachycephalic breeds that are heavily affected by this syndrome, like uh, pugs or uh, French bulldogs and English bulldogs, who are finally the same base, but their uh, their brachycephalism was pushed uh, further, with the difference that they are small breeds, so they don't carry the same weight, you know. I think that if a boxer is very short muzzle, this is a bigger problem than it is for a French bulldog. Got it. Got it. And of course, the French bulldog is not going to do shoots and trials anyways. Uh, yes. Would, so this you know. is where we come to the, the question. Um, is it important to, to consider a boxer as a, as a working dog or not? So I think that once uh, we decide uh, in Europe that we don't longer need uh, working trials, uh, it will affect uh, how the boxers uh, look also. Because this is, I think, the only thing that is, the only thin line that is still holding us from totally uh, going to extreme, is that we still want a dog that is able to run a lot, that is able to, to function more or less normally, mm -hmm. even if uh, criteria are not the same for everybody, you know. But, uh, if we if we decide like in the states that we don't need working trials anymore i'm afraid that uh, it could have really big consequences uh, negative consequences in europe so i'm not i don't necessarily think that we need this to to breed typical boxers with good temperament with dogs that can be guard dogs like written in the standard uh, but is one of the way of selecting them uh, through that got it um I actually wanted to ask you about, you know, you mentioned about um, the importance of hips, uh, the importance of, uh, you also mentioned uh, the testing of hips, you know, as per se, you know, we, we want to, that is, that has actually been something which was focused for European boxers. Uh, now, you also mentioned that the dogs, uh, the you know, the banning of docking and, uh, you know, cropping, changed the complexion of the breed as well, right? The, the, it, it changed the way the dog is constructed, the top line is constructed, uh, it changed how the hindquarters is constructed. Now, what has been constant then, before uh, docking and now, is working trials have been, you know, has been constant. I want to actually talk to you about the issues with the spine. I want to actually ask you a question about the spine. I have read this term called spondylosis, not spondylitis, spondylosis. Yes. Uh, now, with regards to the early onset of spondylosis, do you think the working trials actually uh, make this problem or manifest this problem sooner? Because, you know, in a, for example, in a typical working trial that I've seen, let's say, for example, a bite trial, you know, where the bite testing is done. The dog runs to this uh, person who is the handler, and then the dog grabs that person by the wrist, and this and person and, and this person flings that dog, you know, quite vigorously, and the dog is, you know, is actually holding on to that person. Does this kind of a testing or this kind of a trial 
what will that actually do to a dog which is actually prone to spondylosis? Um, I think that in uh, in most countries, the uh, I know that in most countries, the the, the we test back now uh, first time at one year when we do hips, and then uh, in most of the countries it's demanded to do it again at two years old. So during this period, during one and two, the dog uh, the dog who is uh, in hands of uh, owner who will who wanted to work with him, they will start the the training. So I don't think that somebody who has discovered uh, some you know, beginning of spondylosis with uh, on its dog uh, will will want to work with such a dog because we know now that it is a progressive disease, and uh, for sure environmental also, and uh, and yes, the bite work like we call it, this is certainly quite heavy on the on the body of the dog. It's not only the the spine that gets affected; it's also the muscles, you know, of the neck. Of the jaw, but with, uh, with good quality work, it can be controlled. That it's not extremely dangerous for the dog. But for sure, uh, spondylosis. Uh, I mean, before they did it, you know, and dogs had really horrible backs, and they did. Uh, they brought dogs until three, until without really knowing that the dog had a problem. But I'm I'm sure that some dogs were also uh, paralyzed because of it. You know. It's, uh, it's not something that I would do on a dog that doesn't have a perfect back, for, for sure. Got it. Okay, perfect. Uh, I, I know we have spoken about um, the head, uh, I think, at least uh, enough. Uh, I know we can talk about this for maybe a few hours, but we've spoken, uh, we, we've covered the important points about the head. Uh, we've covered a bit about the, 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 the top line. I want to actually take the next one here. Um, I want to talk about the temperament of the European boxer. Um, in one of the uh, panel discussions that I held with, between uh, Marcello from it Italy and uh, Dan from uh, America, uh, from the United States, uh, one of the things that uh, both of them agreed on was the temperament is something which uh, was lacking in the boxes in the United States which is actually a, a stronger point. It's a strong, it's a virtue for the European boxer. A good temperament is a virtue for European boxers and European boxers have really good head strong, you know, boxer temperament. Uh, they are very, they're not shy dogs. In essence, this was what was discussed in that meeting. Uh, with that premise, I wanna actually ask you this. Um, I have heard that uh, this is an actually a good friend of mine actually has boxes um, from the European lines. And uh, she tells me that if the, the European boxes and the American style boxes are like poles apart in terms of temperament, the European boxer has a very high prey drive. You know, they have an increase, the high prey drive. Now, do you think as a breed preservation uh, uh, breeder, uh, that the increased prey drive temperament seen in the European boxers uh, limits or it's you know makes the boxer not the dog for everybody or limits the number of families that the boxer that the families that can keep boxers uh, yes <laughs> yes absolutely uh, it's a point that I always uh, explain to to puppy buyers that contact me for a puppy uh, boxer is definitely not a breed uh, for everybody <laughs> and I, I will explain why because uh, it's a breed that that is very smart and uh, and needs incredibly a lot of uh, availability you know European boxer I mean I'm not going to put everybody in the same basket because in one liter you will have puppies that are dominant uh, others that have very strong prey drive you will have those that are more you know like middle way uh, you would have uh, all the possible profiles in one liter but the generalization in generally i would say that boxers in europe have more they have they are more more temperamented than than in other countries because it is important to maintain this quality but as a result Yes, this can be a very demanding dog uh, for somebody who doesn't have experience. So I personally don't 
like to sell my puppies to people who have not had uh, several boxers before just to avoid uh, problems you know because of, of because of lack of uh, of experience to managing a puppy uh, that is a bit more demanding but then again, this is also responsibility of the breeder is to find a, a perfect uh, home for every single puppy because every puppy is different and uh, you need to search uh, the profile of owners for con considering the, 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 the temperament of your puppy. This is the first thing that I do is that I question uh, my puppy buyers about their uh, situation at home, about their jobs, about their previous experience with other breeds, with only boxer uh, availability, you know, how, uh, what are they going to do with this dog? And this is extremely important is to, to find adequate homes for every puppy, considering the idea of what they want the dog for. You don't sell a high drive puppy to a, a pet home of uh, two retired people, obviously. So. It's a, it's a mixture of everything, but yes, generally speaking, I would say that the boxer in Europe stays a dog that that is not just a saloon dog. This is a dog that we need to work, that we need to canalize, that we need to move a lot, uh, uh, you know, to 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 release uh, its energy level. Got it. Um, now, I actually wanted to. Uh, I, I know it's, uh, and again, I want to actually go on record to say. Uh, it's not always the negatives. There are a lot of attributes that that, that you know that are likable in a in a European boxer, uh, which I like uh, too as well. But again, the reason that I'm asking you these questions is not to stereotype them uh, that you know these are all the issues. But again, I think it's also important for us to talk about the issues facing the breed because it's you know if we actually um, if we brush the issues under the carpet. You know that's not a brief progression that is only going to be a regression of the issues right so i just want to go on a point and mention that uh now i also want to have an optimistic view uh, and I'm, I'm sure you do as well uh, uh about how this breed can get better now we actually are at this point how could we move this breed forward to the next step uh and I know that you are involved in administrative capacities with club. Now you're aspiring to become a judge as well. I know for people that didn't know it, I actually am I'm the one to tell the news. You're aspiring to become a judge as well. Uh, so, and I'm sure you're involved in some capacity with the club as well. So my question to you is, taking the breed forward, who plays the most important role? Is it the clubs? Is it the breeders? or is it the judges? Who's gonna take the breed in the right direction from here? Uh, I, it's, it's common responsibility. I think to put all the weight on on the clubs or all the weight on the judges or exclusively on the breeders, I think this is not the way. I think that everybody has to work together and maybe the club is the first step towards it because it gathers the members uh, you know around the same breed and uh, and I, I think it's, it's it's extremely important to have uh, mentors you know mentors that have knowledge that are willing to share that are ready to follow uh, a breeder and guide in to, to have a bit of you know internal influence you know constant in, in a breeder's development, this is really important to, to have such people around. Um, but what I think is really important is that breeders understand that they have to learn all the time and that this is not a shame to admit that you don't know everything. Not only that, but this is the beginning of progression is the fact that you admit that you don't know everything. So. Uh, and uh, and to read the standard again and again and again and uh, and this is where the club breed clubs should stay behind to protect the, the integrity of the standard of the breed standard to to and through shows finally to show results finally to to make selection to give guidelines uh, to participants through that shows should absolutely serve as a selection tool. I think this is really, really important. Okay. Yes, right. judging and um, 
and also organizers of the shows, which are clubs, to invite judges that have the integrity and have the, the respect for the brief standard. This is really important because there are many newcomers that just they don't know, you know, how to progress, how to get the knowledge. And the only uh, the only way to do it is to go to shows and hopefully get some feedback on their own dogs. But I'm afraid that in most cases, uh, you know, they get the paper, which is finally quite detailed, but uh, finally doesn't really give them any guideline uh, what is really wrong, what is not correct, and uh, what should be changed in the future. I'm not saying that dogs with mistakes should be uh, eliminated, you know, from population and not be used. I just say that knowing the faults, knowing the deviations away from the standard is, uh, is the first point towards improving uh, the breed. Right. And judges have this capacity and ability to do it. Mm -hmm. sure. They are sure. in the position finally to, to have the power and responsibility to to mark, to point out the the crucial things, pro mm -hmm. crucial problems uh, of, uh, of general population of the boxer and individuals also. Right. Right. True. True. Again, I, I totally agree with your point that the judges have an equal responsibility, but I also agree with you. Sorry. That's okay. My fault. So, <laughs> uh, but I also agree so that the breeder, the bre but I also agree that the breeders who actually, you know, uh, have developed all these puppies have also an equal responsibility to breed the right yeah. style uh, yeah. and impart that knowledge to you know up and coming people so that they you know that's the type of they pass the right knowledge on to up and newcomers who continue to breed you know to do the right thing for the breed and so do the clubs yeah. in picking the right judges totally agree yes with that. i was i must mention two two people that had a really eye-opening effect on on myself uh because it will may help the others to uh, to learn also uh, this was uh, Judy Horton's website, uh, Worldwide Boxer. I think this is a must for for everybody. It's in English, but anybody can use a translator today, so it should not be an excuse. Mm -hmm. It's it's a website that really uh, opens your eyes towards a different perspective. You know, uh, people of uh, different parts of the world who work with the same breed, but have a bit different views. It, it teaches you to appreciate uh, differences and qualities in different styles of boxers. And the third, uh, second person that was, that is very dear to my heart is uh, Karen Rzewski. Uh, she's a lady, a boxer lady that has been involved in the breed uh, for her whole life. She has dedicated her life to that. Uh, she doesn't have any more the possibility to be active now, but she was until very recently. Um, uh, and she was this, you know, this kind of person. She was also a, a breed, breed, war, breed, head of the breed uh, um, in, in Germany for many years. She was the one, you know, who was giving finally, not herself, but she was the president of the breed wardens in, uh, in, in Germany. And she, she was somebody who was known to be a very strict judge uh, in with always integrity until the end and not uh, judging the lead by judging the, the dogs. And I think this is really the type of persons that we should look up to. You know, the judges that will make decisions, even if they are not always easy, but they will do it for the for the good of the breed. Got it. Got it. Uh, I want to actually uh, ask a follow up question to that. Now, you mentioned Judy Harden, who hails from Australia. Who put that yes. uh, website together uh, called the worldwideboxer.com? Uh, yes. uh, great, great resource, great website. And uh, and uh, my question is this: the grass is always greener on the other side. They say, right? They say the grass is always greener on the other side. So for you, um, using the same analogy. What are some of the virtues that you see in boxers, let's say in the United States? or in Canada. Uh, what are some of the virtues that you see that you that actually says, oh my God, I wish I had that? Yes, uh, it, 
it has become obvious to me uh, during the last 15 years i would say that uh, that the americans achieved to uh, to stay truer to the standard than we did in europe honestly because uh, they achieved to keep a dog that um, that is uh, elegant it's, it's only, I will come back to elegance and uh, no, noble and uh, with dry fitting coat with the correct head the ratios, not all of them are perfect, but overall we would say that the muzzles are correct length. Uh, some have two hidden chins, etc. Uh, but basically the, they look much more like a Munich silk head than 95% the, the of boxers in, in Europe. Um, so yes, the, the, the elegance is what I'm missing in, in boxers today, but there, there is a reason for that, uh, why European boxers went away from elegance is that they actually, I don't remember when exactly, it was done about 20 years ago, they took out the word elegance from boxer standard, from FCI boxer standard, before it was here. In the general description, it was written elegant. Now this word doesn't exist anymore. So this was one of the decisive changes, you know, guidelines finally to, br to bring the, the, the European boxer away from what it used to be before. I don't know who is responsible for that. I have to discuss with my German friends who, who was uh, one of the people that that did that <laughs> to be lynched after, I don't know, but I think it was a big mistake. It was a big mistake to do that because we lost uh, uh, an important detail, uh, which is finally keeping this, uh, this breed in balance, you know, regarding what, in my opinion, should bo a boxer should be a medium-sized, athletic, noble dog uh, that is not too heavy, that is not light, so it's a, it's an important detail that was changed, and it had a, uh, it had a consequences on on our breed. But it doesn't mean that just because it's not written that we cannot somehow you know bring it back. Okay, uh, if you know you have an art in front of you, you have the art or the silhouette of the current German boxer right now, mm -hmm. and uh, let's say they say you know what. Danya, you have the tools to fix it. Here are the tools to fix it. And my question is about blending styles now. Would you mm. say blending style is one of the tools that you have on your hands to fix the style of the present day European boxer? Uh, I think that uh, this is always the answer for, for everything is to blend different characteristic together. Uh, we have different styles of boxers in Europe also, you know, we, we they are not all the same. We have very, very different kinds of boxers in Europe. So, and I personally achieved to, to make a lot of progress with only using European lines until now. But uh, it would be very beneficial, I think, if uh, breeders opened up and, uh, and try to search for things that they are lacking in, in other continents also, because it would allow us to advance uh, faster uh, in, uh, in, uh, in recovering, for example, the neck length, the dryness, uh, but then again, not, not neglecting other things that we have already fixed here. I think that we did a lot of, uh, a lot of advancement in, in, uh, in health in Europe, in the States, some tests, but it's not systematical. So I think it, it's a project that is very, very, very interesting, but with certain level of precaution, because if we neglect health point of view, we we might find ourselves with additional problems, you know, adding to health, already existing health problems that we have, uh, and adding some more coming from outside. So it's it's an important thing to consider when you are um, uh, when you are thinking about uh, using. Uh, and in fact, this was the point that still holds me back: is that I I. Uh, for the moment, I don't have enough uh, insurance, you know, enough uh, uh, 
um, confidence to, to import dogs that have the background that I don't know well enough. You know, you work on the heart since 25 years and then you find yourself okay with maybe one dog, the dog that you import, for example, or Simon, that is okay. But then, you know, grandfather, I, I don't know who behind has a problem that you are not aware of. So you have to know the lines before uh, making any decisions, I think. True, sure. agreed. No, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, I actually am down to the, my last three questions. Um, so you, the difficult questions are done. So I just have the last three ones uh, to, to, to bring us back, bring us home. Uh, now you mentioned about your uh, you mentioned about your family, you know, in terms of your three kids that keep you busy. Uh, how important or how difficult is it for you to, uh, you know, what are some of the difficulties and how do you overcome them? You know, and you're in, in breeding dogs, in, in doing what you're passionate about. How do you balance these things? Because a lot of us have that challenge, right? Uh, we have dogs at home, but we have other priorities as well. How do you balance them? It's a big challenge. It's not always easy because dogs will eat up the time that you could spend with the children. Uh, children don't always understand. They love the dogs, but they also like to have all their time for them. You know, they do activities besides school and uh, and you have to participate in all that. So it's, I guess it's a matter of, uh, of choice, you know, at some point, because uh, breeding will take a lot of your time. It's, uh, and it, especially with this breed, you know, you always have uh, puppies, you need to be uh, practically blocked during two months. I practically don't leave the house, you know, literally. I, I'm lucky to work at home, but it means that, uh, you know, my husband has to take over to bring the kids to the training and go and fetch them. And so you need to have a, a family that understands uh, the passion. Without that, uh, it would be very, very difficult. And I know many friends that stopped to breed while they had kids in this period. But for me, it was just not possible to stop <laughs> to breathe. It's, uh, it's really important for me, for my, uh, you know, mental health to have, uh, to, to keep doing that, um, uh, that really uh, occupies, you know, my thoughts. And uh, it's it's very important to me. And, and if you don't have the, 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 the conditions uh, or the will to overcome yourself when you have difficult periods in breeding and uh, you, you will not be able to do it but it doesn't mean that you cannot come back when kids are a bit bigger but you need to stay tuned you need to stay attached to the breed and know what is happening you, have, you need to know the dogs and luckily the internet uh, allows us uh, to be um, informed easier than than used to be the case so 30 years ago imagine they they had uh, books, you know, once per year, and the rest was happening at shows, and they had to do a lot of kilometers. And if you are not that, you just were totally cut out from the world. The phones internationally they cost a fortune, and okay. so, so we are very lucky to be uh, to be in this uh, to live in this period now when uh, when we have uh, these uh, technological uh, advantages. True, very true. Oh so, yes, uh, so we so still uh, go on breathing, yeah. <laughs> um, now, now on to a question that's going to actually take you. Uh, that's going to actually take you back in time. I. Uh, this is a time travel question. If you watch this uh, question I asked Linda, I'm going to ask you the same question in time. If you went back in time, uh, if you had Doctor Brown's time machine, you know, to go back to sit in the time machine and go back in time. But doctors, Dr. Brown's time machine was a, uh, was a small car. But let's say you had a big van. You had like a big van, uh, which you can bring three dogs back with you, back from time. Um, tell me the name of uh, the dogs that you would like to bring back with you. Uh, I'm not going to give you names of, of dogs uh, from, from other continents, be because I, I'm not too familiar, you know, and I don't want to judge this big question on the base of photos, you know, it's important. But uh, there, were, uh, there was one dog 
that unfortunately I did not get to see in live, but I saw many dogs from this line. Uh, for me, the absolute uh, image, perfect image uh, of the, the standard is uh, Tenor del Hermo. For me, this dog is uh, just uh, wonderful. So, and there were uh, two other dogs that really marked me. Uh, they are descendants of the same line uh, of these dogs that are almost extinct today. They are uh, old uh, Vorigben uh, lines from Holland that had a lot, a lot of qualities that we are lacking today and that unfortunately we did not achieve to preserve, unfortunately. We have the answer here in Europe, but they just kind of let them go, bye-bye. So we have only a few dogs now that they can recover these pedigrees back. So uh, another bitch from these lines was uh, Alejandra Trandia. She was a uh, Spanish bred, and she was a bitch that was just uh, just spectacular. She was sporty. She had, a, you know, this kind of poison. She was the queen in the ring. Uh, she had a bit too short puzzle, but okay, we will forget about that. She was a wonderful individual, really. And um, uh, Xanto de la Hermo, he's uh, one of the siblings from the famous ex uh, ex litter of uh, de la Hermo. He was also a wonderful dog, a bit too long in the back, but just this kind of dogs that, uh, you know, mark you uh, forever. But absolutely, Tenor de la Hermo for me was really um, a magnificent uh, specimen. Unfortunately, he did not... Uh, leave behind uh, enough of descendants because after he was sold to uh, to Australia, I think, and uh, he did not have any descendants there. But uh, I think this was a dog that was overlooked uh, during his time in Europe, like many, like many, unfortunately. Right. Uh, we are down to the last question. Uh, so you've done extremely well. And uh, I think this interview has uh, given us a lot of important uh, perspectives, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of interesting observations about the breed. So thank you so much for that. Um, my final question to you is this: um, You know, the last I would say the last 14, 15 months has actually changed the landscape of dog shows a lot. COVID, with the introduction of COVID, things have changed. Dog shows have. Uh, dog shows have changed we've acquired new habits uh which is a plus in a way because you know we we are actually uh we value things more now than we used to before now as breeders as breeders uh breed lovers and breed pres you know breed preservation lovers what would be your advice to breeders going forward on for the to actually to do some things different for the breed uh, yes, this COVID uh, situation is uh, very, very interesting and uh, as it is some precedent. I don't know this is said in English, but never happened before, you know. So, so I, uh, to people who are, who are used to go to shows a lot, for sure it gives them a lot of time on their hands uh, that uh, maybe something else can be done with their dogs. So uh, for me, uh, for me personally, it did not change much because uh, during the least, least couple of years, I was not doing many shows due to lack of time. But uh, it, we should always come back to the to the main fact, uh, to the main reason why we have dogs. Why do we do that? Why do we sacrifice all our money and spare time on dogs? Do we do it to, to win on shows? Do we do it to to get to know our dogs better, to to spend more time with them. So I guess everybody had a bit more of time to think about priorities. I hope that people understood that uh, shows are not the center of the world and maybe not the most important thing that they can do with their dogs. I hope that for dogs, because I think that uh, dogs can have a very nice life uh, without making too many shows also. Agreed, very true. Very, very rightly said. You know, dogs. Uh, you know, shows are not the reason we keep dogs. Uh, of course, that's that's like an icing on the cake, but uh, they that's occupy cool. an important place in our life, and uh, we should always enjoy that. And I think on that note, um, 
I want to again thank you so much for your uh, time uh, in, in thank you. sharing your journey. And uh, and again, uh, this interview is going to be up uh, uploaded on YouTube uh, under the Indian Boxer Ring channel. So it is a permanent record. So for those folks that uh, missed the early portions of this interview, or for those ones that would would love the, who love the interview because I did, uh, who want to go back and watch this interview all over again. It's going to be available on YouTube. Uh, feel free to share this interview with your friends or who you, your boxer friends who might find this interesting and useful. Uh, and again, always click on, uh, just like a YouTuber would say, click on the subscribe button. So you actually have the Indian Boxer Ring channel as your favorites on YouTube for you to watch. Uh, before we end the interview, Daniel, do you have any, any, uh, any comments, parting comments? I no, not especially. I would just like to to see to say that uh, that everybody should enjoy their dogs uh, and until they are still here. I've lost uh, my uh, my granny a few few days ago, and it brings you back maybe some regrets. Maybe I should have done this and that. So live uh, live the moment and give uh, give the best uh, to your dogs because this is about dogs it's about it's not about people this we do that for them and because of them and because they bring a much much of happiness uh, to our lives and they give us everything so they deserve the best very true and again sorry for your loss again Daniel. Okay. um thank you thank and you. Uh, thank you again for doing this have yourself a wonderful day and uh, and we will connect again in another interesting interview two weeks from now so we don't have an interview the next week but we have another one on sunday april the 4th and uh, this is going to be with uh, a boxer specialist uh, from the united kingdom thank you everybody have a wonderful day bye bye <laughs>